Fifth grade ELA text set author illustrator study Ted and Betsy Lewin. Listen to this quote. At home, we talk of nothing but gorillas. As I fall asleep at night, I make gorilla vocalizations. And when I am asleep, I dream of gorillas. Who do you think might say something like that? Well, we're about to find out who it was. Listen while I read Gorilla Walk by Ted and Betsy Lewin. Think about why this person might be so obsessed with mountain gorillas. Introduction. In 1905, a German army officer named Oskar von Berningen decided to climb Mount Sabino in Africa's Rango Range, hoping to impress the local chiefs and other colonial powers with German military might. While camped on a steep ridge, he encountered and shot two large man-like apes, one of which he brought back. Von Bering's spe specimen, specimen was the first mountain gorilla ever seen by Western scientists. Through a mountain, gorillas probably never existed in huge numbers. Today, fewer than 900 remain in the world. There are three subspecies of gorillas. The eastern lowland, found in the rainforest of the Congo. The western lowland, found in the western Africa. And the mountain gorilla, found only in the Varenga range of w Wanda. The Congo in the tiny impenetrable forest of Uganda. Uganda. Because mountain gorillas live at higher altitudes, they are the bulkiest and heavy, have the longest, thickest coats. Now, the relationships between mountain gorillas and humans has been tragic. Gorillas' heads are valued as trophies. Their hands are made into ashtrays. Adult gorillas will fiercely defend their young, so the adults are often killed by poachers. Stealing the babies for illegal trade in endangered animals. Gorillas are ma maimed by poachers, snars intended for other forest creatures, and their habitat has been exploited for logging, mining, and agricultural. In the 20 years of the, after the von Beringen's discovery of the mountain gorillas, at least 50 were killed or captured in the Varengas. To protect them, in 1925, the Belgian colonial government of what is now Rwanda created Africa's first national park, the Albert National Park. By the 1950s, George Schiller, Schaller, the first person to study mountain gorillas in the wild, estimated a population of 450. By 1980, the population had dropped to 250. The park had been split, the middle section given away, and almost half the gorilla habitat had been turned over to agriculture. Civil war and poaching also accounted for many deaths. The mountain gorillas in Uganda have fared somewhat better. In 1932, the area of Wendy was set aside as the impenetrable forest reserve, which became Wendy National Park in 1981, is now called Wendy Impro Penetrable National Park. The park lies entirely within the country of Uganda and is small and carefully managed. So now we're in Africa and New Uganda. In local language, Bwani means a muddy, swampy place full of darkness. It is one of the few forests in the world to have survived the Palestine area, era. The time of the glaciers and is well over 25,000 years old. It is home to some species of animals, birds, butterflies, and trees that can be found nowhere else on earth. And today it is home to 400 mountain gorillas, often half the world's population. Of these three groups, totaling about 30 individuals have been habitured, made comfortable in the presence of humans, and can be visited by tourists. Habituring mountain gorillas take up to two years and is not an easy process for either the Ugandan trackers who do it for, or the gorillas. The trackers begin by following a specific group of wild gorillas daily. As they draw close to the gorillas will either charge or run away at first, but gradually trackers are able to shorten the distance between them and the gorillas. This takes both patience and courage, for even when faced with a challenge cha charging gorilla, the trackers must remain calm making the belching sounds of the gorillas to reassure them. The process must be very stressful for both gorillas and trackers at first, 
But over time, the gorillas accept the presence of humans and behave quite normally. Habituation is, however, not yet complete. For although the gorillas are not habituated to Africans, they are not yet habituated to white people. So white volunteers are recruited to accompany the African trackers and the process begins again. Despite the difficulty of habituation, it has become critical to saving the mountain's gorilla. Because of it, wild gorillas can be visited by tourists, which brings in a lot of foreign revenue, making the mountain gorilla both an important natural resource and a source of national pride. The first gorilla ecotourism started in Rwanda in 1978 was a huge success both financially and for the gorillas, whose population has increased over time to 400 animals. On the downside, habituation exposes the mountain gorillas to human diseases that could prove fatal. To reduce the risk of infection, visitors with permits are restricted to six per group and are allowed to spend only one hour with the gorillas. A minimum distance of 15 feet must be maintained because gorillas have no immunity to childhood diseases. No one under the age of 15 is allowed to visit, no, nor are tourists showing any signs of sickness. Habituated gorillas are also much more vulnerable to poachers, who in 1995 killed seven. Four of them were spread to death while trying to protect an infant. That's sad. The infant was taken and is presumed dead as well. Interestingly, habituated gorillas are shunned by other gorillas. No one knows why. But in light of risk of habituation, it makes sense. Despite these problems, ecotourism seems the only way gorillas can be saved. As long as, as it generates revenue and jobs, it provides a strong incentive for the surrounding community to protect mountain gorillas in their habitat. When you're going to visit the mountain gorillas, Uganda says, Ah, you're going to see those, those people in the forest. When we were kids, the only mountain gorillas we saw were pictures of dead ones. Their huge arms tied spread-edged eagle between two trees, posing dutifully beside them, spear in hand. Both of us dreamed of someday seeing these magnificent animals alive and free. But of course, that wasn't even possible until the 1970s, when the business of ecotourism began. Then civil wars and political chaos in the area forced us to postpone our journey several times. But finally, in November 1997, we are in southern Uganda, on our way to meet the mountain gorilla. After landing at Entebbe Airport, we, we spent the night in Kampala. Now we're bumping along on a muddy, rutted road in, in a com, combi. Combi. We've been traveling for nine hours and are still three hours from Bwindi Impenetrable National Park. With no sign of forest yet in sight, just endless terraced hillsides rolling back from the road. As dark overtakes us, the green hills, now black, are shrouded with mist. The lights of a town in the valley below us look like fallen stars. Finally ahead, we see the gate to the National Park. Just beyond, lanterns have been set are like Oh, our like beacons on the front porches of the guest cottages. Tiny cell-like rooms with cor corrugated tin roofs. Once inside our cottage, we ready our cameras and gear for the morning. Then flop in the bed, exhausted. It's pitch black except for the warm glow from the lantern on our porch. So, based on the preparations and what we already know about the Lewin, let's predict what this journey will be like. K group. At first light, we step out onto the porch. Directly in front of us, the steep forest slopes of Bwindi rise into the morning mist. By 8.30, we picked up our gorilla permits, $150 each per day. We're going to visit K Group, a small family of four. A silverback, only adult male gorillas have this distinctive marking. A juvenile and a female with a two-week-old baby. We're told we'll be back by noon, so in addition to our rain gear, two cameras, tw 20 rolls of film, pocket tape recorders, journals, binoculars, sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs, and fruit, we packed enough water for a three- to four-hour trek. A light, litter, lighter apiece. A liter apiece, I'm sorry. We each 
select a stout walking stick from a bunch leaning against the wall of the park office banda or hut then pile into a small pickup truck we'll start our tracking on the other side of the park accompanied by two trackers a ranger guide and one porter each to carry our gear half hour later we leave the truck pass two guards armed with machine guns at the trailhead and start down a muddy well-traveled path passing thatched hut homes Dead and neat fields of stor- sorghum, potatoes, bananas, corn, elephant grass, and tea. A long tea, a lone tea picker, picker, barely take notice of us. We climb up the terrace slopes. Behind us, we look down on cultivated fields that stretch all the way to Lake Edward, and the distant Ruinzori Mountains. In front of us, a wall of 150-foot high trees. Marks the beginning of the impenetrable impre- forest. The trackers hack their way into the dense gloom, and we begin to climb step slopes, slipping on the muddy, rooting vegetation beneath our feet. Huge trees look strangled with vines. Giant tree ferns are everywhere. Their trunks girdled with needle-sharp thorns. Long rope-like vines with thorns curved like cat claws snatch at our ankles. We stumble and grab for handholds, but yet, but get hun- handfuls of thorns instead. Our hands and arms begin to look as if we've been in a, in a cat fight. So, paragraph one, how do you think the Lewins feel about their journey so far and why? After climbing for two hours, we are soaked with sweat. So far, no grills. We slip and slide down 60-degree slopes through moss-covered trees to an escarpment. Forty feet below, a jungle stream rushes along K Group, has somehow gotten down there and crossed to the other side, but it's too steep for us. We move along the edge, our glasses fog, sweat pouring into our eyes and soaking our shirts. We pause to drink deeply from our water bottles. At this rate, we'll be out of water soon. Covered with mud and slime, we slide on our backs down a very sleep, sleep, steep slope to the edge of the stream, then cross it on slippery moss-covered rocks using our walking sticks for balance. On the opposite bank is a solid wall of vegetation and thorny tree ferns. The trackers hack and slice their way up the slope, loose the trail, backtrack to start up another way. We follow three different steps up, our boots barely gripping, we slide back down on our stomach in the mud. That sounds just wonderful. It's one o'clock and the heat and humidity are dreadful. We drink the last of our water, then start up up again. Caked with mud, our hearts pounding from extortion, and our our faces sucked in from dehydration, our hair matted down with sweat. Ahead, the trackers hack away like machines, their green uniforms still smart and dry. After five hours, we find gorilla tracks from yesterday, broken branches and fresh dung. The trackers whistle softly, almost inaudibly, to locate each other in the thick underbrush. One step at a time, our walking sticks jabbing the mud, we head down yet another slippery slope to the bottom of a ravine. Here there is a stream so wide it creates a break in the forest canopy. Sunlight pours in glistening on the count coppery water that rushes over mossy rocks. We take off our steamed up glasses, wipe the sweat from our faces, catch our breath, and cross the stream while helping hands with our porters. I'm going to stop there.